This is hard to follow all of these really good folk. <laughs> I'm going to time myself. I do not write manuscripts out beforehand, so people like me have to watch the time. Yeah, yeah, I probably won't even need these. It's just my security blanket. Um, I have an MDiv from Seminex, and Ed is part of the reason that I have an MDiv. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, unlike most of the Seminex uh, graduates who go to crossings conferences these days, I did not have uh, Bob er or Ed, Bob Bertram or Ed Schrader, for the main systematic classes. Uh, Fred Needner taught me systematics, and he was an um, um, Old Testament student, almost finished with his PhD at that time, THD. Um, but I did have Ed for one class that I can remember, if memory serves, and I'm not even sure of the title. Um, it was team taught, I believe. I think it was um, historical critical methodology and law gospel theology. Anybody have a class like that? Like maybe, maybe a 1.5 and Ed was one teacher and I don't know who the other one was. Um, but what I remember, I have one image of a class that, uh, that semester, I believe it was, and um, Ed was working Galatians, and as you know, the burden of Galatians is uh, all the epistles, there's a problem, you know, Paul's already been there, he leaves, they mess it up, and then he writes letters and saying, yeah, 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 you did it all wrong, and then he t proclaims the gospel, straighten them out, and then the last chapter or two is, therefore, how you're supposed to live. So Ed was uh, giving us the summary of what St. Paul said, St. Ed said, well, what, what the um, Galatians, the Judaizers, had done, uh, the ones who beguiled the Galatians whom he had um, evangelized, he said, uh, it said, they were, they were trying to give them a new and improved gospel. They told these Gentiles that if you really wanted to be good Christians, I mean, it was okay to be a Christian, but if you really wanted to be a really, really good Christian, you had to first become a really good Jew, which included circumcision, and there's the phrase, the circumcision party. <laughs> I always wonder what that would be like. <laughs> and, and, and Ed says, but whenever you have gospel plus anything, you no longer have gospel. When you have gospel with added whiteners and brighteners, you don't have gospel. It might work for detergents, but it doesn't work for the gospel. And I have always loved that, and I, I, can, I can still see him standing there in his shirt and his little belly pouched out a little bit, you know, going like this. And I, that image comes up again and again, but it is such beautiful. A number of people have mentioned his earthiness and his homey images. You know, what a beautiful, clean, clear articulation of the proper distinction between law and gospel. If it's gospel plus, or if it's added whiteners and brighteners, you ain't got gospel anymore. And it, it, I return to it again and again. And then as, um, as he got to the you know, joy, peace, love uh, part that, that Paul talks about in Galatians 5, Ed says, so it's not that we gotta do this stuff, we get to. We don't gotta do it, we get to do it. And I, I don't know that there's a year that I don't use that in a sermon. I mean, it's just, it's just a brilliant way of talking about how now do you live in the face of having heard this gospel proclamation. But that was pretty much the sum total of my experience as Ed in the classroom as a professor. So I arrived in, Sem uh, in St. Louis, um, 75, June of 75, I had uh, gone through the deaconess program at Valpo. When I was about 10 or 11, I won't take you through my whole life, when I was about 10 or 11, I told my mother I wanted to be a missionary when I grew up. Well, as Missouri said, and she said, well, you can't, you're a girl. So you can either, you can either be um, a deaconess or you can marry a missionary. Well, I was 11 at most. I didn't know how to marry a missionary when I was 11. Actually, I couldn't be able to figure it out now either. But. Um, <laughs> And, and so from the age of 11, before I was confirmed, my focus was to be a deaconess, and that was my plan. I went through uh, high school planning it, I, uh, St. John's College, I went to Valpo, finished up there. Um, but what, you know, it wasn't enough. I tried 
all kinds of little deaconess jobs. I created internships for myself. I went into the hospital in Omaha and said, I want to work with the deaconess, you know, and they found me a $2 an hour job. The Lutheran Women's Missionary League paid for me to spend my time in nursing home across the street and the hospital, and, and so I had a number of them, and it just wasn't enough. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there were women who were becoming ordained in the Lutheran Church, and I remember we had a study at Valpo um, on whether women could or could not theologically be pastors, and I had become convinced that they could, but it wasn't my calling. Um, and so deaconesses in that era that I was there, we became very clear that our calling was word and service, not word and sacrament. And it was, you know, we, we clung to it, we had to. I mean, after half your life has been spent on this focus, you don't give it up all that quickly. So, but I, I needed more. Um, I needed more theological education. I was hungry for it. And uh, being Missouri Synod, there wasn't any school I could consider except a Missouri Synod school, which meant there was one seminary. And fortunately, um, that was Seminex, and uh, the, the walkout had happened a year before, and I knew some of the guys who were there. I'd gone to St. John's, they weren't heretics. So, um, <laughs> So uh, Jan Audie, as it turns out, was on outreach at Valpo, and she said, well, if you come to St. Louis, and this was in April, she said, you can stay with me. So I did. I moved in with Jan in June of uh, 1975, and she was living with Al Bowles. She was, uh, lived in their third floor apartment there. He was a pastor of Bethel. So I moved in there, and I started going to church at Bethel. And that's where I met the Schraders. It was first, to, and many of the Seminex faculty, first as fellow parishioners, not as professors. And um, I remember one time, um, it, Ed was such a homey teacher. One time, I was in, it was a summertime, I think, and I was invited to Sunday dinner. I don't know if you remember that. And y'all probably got a smaller piece of meat because I was there or something, you know. That's where I learned, according to Ed, that one of the grandmas, I asked Marie last night, she said it wasn't Grandma Hoyer, but um, I think it was Grandma Schrader said that if you didn't have potatoes at a meal, you didn't need to say the blessing beforehand. Um, so I was sitting next to Ed, he said, is there potatoes or not today? <laughs> But one of the things he did is that we had green peas, and he took about a half a dozen peas off his plate and lined them up next to his plate on the tablecloth. You're frowning. I don't know what the lesson was, but he was teaching me something with green peas from his plate lined up. And, and so there was all these, and thank you for that graciousness that your family just kind of you know, moved over for folks who were last minute invitees. Um, that, that's kind of my, the, my homey images of Ed. But I have to tell you about um, one time, he, several times, he really made me mad. <laughs> so as I said, I arrived at, at Seminex not intending to be a pastor. I just wanted more theological education. So I applied for the MAR program. Uh, they accepted me into the MDiv, and I had to write David Yago back and say, no, 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 I, I'm not going to MDiv. I'm not going to do that. I'm a deaconess. So I wore my deaconess pin the whole first year. Now, I never took any MAR classes, mind you. Gwen Saylor, another deaconess, had said, well, after you have a theology degree from Valpo, it's kind of like taking graduate Sunday school classes. So she didn't highly recommend them, but I don't know if anyone was even teaching them. I do know that I registered at the very end of the line because all the MDivs first registered, and then you could have what's ever left over. So I took a fourth year course my first semester, and then I had a first year, and I don't know. It was just all a mess. But I, I was clinging to uh, my deaconess identity. As I said, I had been working on it for 12 years. And um, I, I was, but, but there wasn't much support for that. Um, there wasn't much support for anything for the women's seminarians. And uh, with all due respect and sympathy for my colleagues, my male colleagues, they were in an uproar too. I mean, Seminex had just blown apart so many things for those of us who, in Missouri Synod, when there hadn't been a split since what it started, 1850, 49, whatever. And um, so, so families were being torn apart. There was a lot of financial insecurity. We weren't sure whether there were going to be uh, jobs at, at, after graduation. Um, this this um, 
male buddy club that was the Missouri Synod Ministerium was suddenly going to have women in there and that was destabilizing everybody that added a whole new sexual dimension to seminary life remember 60s short skirts remember that time and so it was there were folks uh, one one guy at Trinity had tried to uh, recruit me saying well if you come to our seminary you won't uh, you won't leave single so I'm sure there were people there <laughs> who thought the only reason women were at seminaries because they're really looking for a husband, you know. So there wasn't a lot of help kind of discerning your calling. And then on the other hand, I had this deaconess piece I was trying to maintain. But to be fair, I wasn't real clear either because, as I say, I never took an MAR course. My last year at Valpo, I signed up for Greek, aced it. You know, you didn't need that for being deaconess. So, you know, I was probably a little unclear myself. So, but anyway, I was trying to hang on to being who I was. And um, so I remember, remember those elevators at 607, 11 flights up, remember? And so I was in the elevator with Ed one time, and he squawked at me. You know how he could squawk? <laughs> Ruthie, when are you going to do the right thing? And I would get so mad. And I remember that happening more than once. I was trying to be faithful to what I saw as my calling, and he was poking and poking and pushing and pushing. Um, I'm glad he did. I mean, <laughs> the end of that year, I did switch the MDiv program. Um, but he was, he was one who didn't let all those things that I said were, got in the way of some others seeing what my gifts were. Um, he saw other gifts. And he saw that I, had pa I was pastoral. Uh, that was my calling. And he poked and prodded until finally I did it. Um, Marie was the same way. I remember my, I did my field work at Bethel because um, that's where I was, and it was just easier to have Ruth Jewell preaching there because she's already, you know, in the pews. Um, but I was so nervous when I, I still get terribly nervous, and, and afterwards a sermon, uh, I was, I think, talking about how nervous I was, and you said to me, well, I don't know why you get nervous. You really are good. And I, I still remember that, and I'm so grateful that you said it because that, too, was a part of my discernment. Um, I think that's it. I'm sure I've taken up my 10 minutes. I just want to say one more thing that Herb Schmidt called me and he sends his condolences and he said that he was in Ed's class and that the two of them started Seminary Press together and then that you two, uh, all, the four of you all kind of connected in Bali as well. So he wanted me to send, give you those greetings. So, okay, thank you.